Okay. Okay. Why don't we do our notes on collisions? Um, I do want to get started right away because the last two examples kind of suck. I will make some time for them. Yeah, you did that one already. So, um, here's kind of how the day is going to go. Uh, we're going to talk about the general theory behind how collisions are going to work. Uh, then we're going to do a whole bunch of examples. The first ones are going to be very straightforward, very basic. Uh, you probably don't need my help at all to do them, I imagine. Um, then we're going to do one that's more challenging because it's in two dimensions. And I'm going to show you the long way of doing it first, which is very purposeful because then I'm going to show you the shortcut way of doing it using the cosine law. And you'll be like, why didn't you show me this in the first place? And, but there's, there's a reason why. Because the very, very last example we're going to do, you can't use the cosine law to cheat with. So we need to make sure you understand the basic premise about how to really do things on a fundamental level. So we'll start with a whole bunch of pictures, though, first. So. So, okay, today is kind of the, the main lesson in the momentum unit. Basically, we're going to talk about how we can use momentum to solve anything that, like, collides and crashes with each other. Um, yesterday, we talked real quick about the idea of, um, where would we go? You know how Newton's first law is inertia? Newton's second law was this. Your, your net of all forces is mass times acceleration. And really, that was the basic premise behind what... That was the basic premise behind what allowed us to get to this formula. Because if uh, acceleration is a change in velocity over a change in time, if you throw that change in time over on the other side here, you get F delta T equals M delta V. And either of those were known as the impulse. So that's kind of the, the goal from yesterday, was to talk about the basic math behind that. Um, today our goal then is to kind of uh, elaborate on that and talk about the basically the three main possibilities here. Either we're going to stop an object, it's just going to smash into a wall and completely stop. Uh, we could just slow it down, right? Or it hits something and then it you know hits some frictional forces and eventually slows down. Or I mean these examples here like the ones of the baseball or the tennis racket, uh, the impulse could even send it backwards in a direction. Um, are you guys baseball fans? Okay. <laughs> uh, one of the biggest stats they uh, use right now to try to figure out who's a, a good baseball hitter is called exit velocity. Okay. Uh, basically, the concept is the pitcher throws a pitch towards the hitter, and the hitter tries to hit it, and maybe the guy makes contact, maybe he doesn't. You know, Once in a while, uh, a baseball player will hit a baseball with a really, really good swing, and he just gets really unlucky because he hits it like right at somebody, right? And it's right there to catch it, and it's like, oh man, that was just so unfortunate, right? And so what what they started started tracking using the physics software, I imagine, is the velocity as the ball leaves the bat, with the basic idea being that although on individual instances someone can get very unlucky and just the guy standing right there and catches it, long story short, if you hit the ball back with a faster speed than other people do, then you're probably a better hitter. Does that make sense? And it tries to, tries to account for the luck factor, depending on where people are standing to catch the ball. Okay. Right. Anyways. Um, there we go. So let's talk about some of the main scenarios here we've got. Um, first, before I get to that, though, I guess, uh, we should talk about how, again, this requires an isolated system. You guys remember the systems? Open, closed, isolated. We do have to assume that energy is not being lost. Um, is that actually the case in real life? No, not really. Actually, no, that's not true. Um, we're going to talk about that tomorrow. There is one scenario where we're going to talk about where we would expect energy not to be lost. Um, yeah, let's talk about it now. Do you guys know the terms macroscopic versus microscopic? What's the difference? Yeah, a macroscopic system is something that you can visibly see and touch, right? Whereas microscopic, we're talking, I mean, you need a microscope, right? Um, collisions between electrons would probably have energy conserved because there would be no loss due to friction and stuff like that. And I've got some reasons for it. I actually have a slide I know in upcoming notes about this. But if you get to a system that is small enough where you're talking about subatomic particles colliding, usually those ones actually are considered to be isolated systems, actually. But we'll get to that. Long story short here, there is a conservation of momentum principle. So long as it's isolated. So the idea is your momentum before and after should be the same. Okay. Uh, I got a photo here. I found this one online. 
you guys ever see like cannons like this? You know, like on old fashioned Pirates of the Caribbean ships where they're shooting the cannon, right? Why is there this roof on the back of it? Yeah, because what happens is when the cannon launches its uh, cannonball in that direction, the cannon itself recoils backwards this direction. And so it's got some sort of rope on it to prevent it from like rolling all the way past the other side of the ship and breaking through the other side. You know what I mean? So that's conservation of momentum. Whatever momentum we have that goes this way, it better be conserved by momentum that goes the other way, right? There should be a conservation there. Very similar to forces, right? I've already kind of proved to you earlier that forces and momentum are really, they're related to each other. Like they're, they're the same mathematical principle. Okay, so here's the five main types of things we'll work through today. Uh, I'll give you some pictures first, and we'll do the math. So you've got linear collisions where objects separate. Uh, why don't I just do them with the pictures here, actually? Here's an example of linear collisions where ob objects separate. Imagine that you're shooting a pool ball, and uh, you hit one pool ball into the other one, and the first one crashes into the other one, and then they both go their, their separate ways. And by linear, what I'm referring to is the fact that like it's all in the same plane of motion, we're not going to have one go this way and one go this way yet. We will do that, but to keep things simple, for a linear one, it's not going off on the side. It's basically just this one hits this one, that one goes up. So that's one possibility. A second possibility, it's still in one dimension, but now they stick together. And in some examples, that may seem silly, like how could the pool ball stick together? But imagine that a car rear ends another car, right? So you're sitting at a stoplight. So this has never happened to you, right? Someone comes up behind you, rear ends you, both cars move forward together as one collective object. Does that make sense? Uh, third scenario, an explosion. This is my personal favorite. Uh, this is like the cannon one, where one thing goes left, one thing goes right. Now, explosions can be in one dimension, where one goes left, one goes right, just along one plane of motion. You could have it so that one part of it goes up to the corner, one part goes over to the corner, one part goes down. It could go in two dimensions. Um, by the way, in theory, all of these things actually do happen in three dimensions. We're just not going to do three dimensions. Two. Those ones are probably the easiest ones to do. These are the ones that are more challenging. Intersecting collisions. This is where like object one is going this way, object two is going this way, and either they could collectively go off like that, or if they don't collectively go off in one uh, one direction, perhaps they can um, have like one bounce out that way, one bounce out this way. That particular scenario I'm going to show you here, that's the really sucky one we're going to do last. It's, it's, it's a lot of work. Uh, and then the last possibility is a glancing collision. I like a pool, uh, sorry, a, a, a curling shot as a good example of this. Where you have like a, do you guys know curling type terms? You know what a peel is? Where you have like a stationary stone there, and you shoot the rock and you peel it off, and they kind of go out in a Y. So you'd have like a, you know, one stone sitting here, a stone will come up and hit it, one will go this way, one will go this way. Those are basically the main types of collisions we'll do. So, okay, here we go. Let's do some math. So we'll start with the easy ones, we'll get to the challenging ones, then I'll show you a shortcut using cosine law that sometimes you can use, and then we'll do one where you can't use the cosine law, it's going to suck. Okay, um, I'd always recommend draw a picture. you got a white billiard ball moving at 8 meters per second to the right, so let's see, we'll make this one the white one. It's moving right at 8 meters per second. This thing is 0 0.15 kilograms. And it hits a black billiard ball with the same mass. Seems glitchy today. Only it's at rest. Uh, then it says the right ball continues to move to the right at 2.5. So if this is like the before picture, so this one was at rest. Just so I have a picture set there. So I'm shooting the ball at this one here. It says the white ball continues to move at the right, to the right. So the white ball is still moving this way, but now it's only going 2 meters per second, 2.5 meters per second. The question is, well, what's the velocity of the black ball? So, I mean, this is pretty much exactly a cool shot. You can kind of envision this, right? The black ball should now be here, and the black ball should also be moving. We need to know it's there. 
It's really like you have a basic setup here. Um, in general, the conservation momentum looks something like this. The amount of momentum you have before should be the amount of momentum you have afterwards in each vector direction. So since everything is in a linear direction right now, I don't have to break this up into x or y. In the future, I will have to break it up into x and y. So, so let's talk about what sort of momentum you have before you started. Did the white ball have momentum? Yeah, it was moving. So I could say the mass of the white ball before times the velocity of the white ball before. All right, well, I could also then try to figure out the momentum of the black ball. So then there's the mass of the black ball before times the velocity of the black ball before. But actually, this is kind of silly to do, right? Why? Because it was at rest, right? So even though the mass of the black ball, it did have a mass beforehand, since its velocity was zero, we could basically have just ditched this whole thing. Uh, by the way, I want to point out one more thing. I know I'm being really meticulous with my little subscripts here. I know it seems kind of silly to put the mass of the white ball before, because you might think, well, what if the mass doesn't change? And in this example here, the mass of the ball wouldn't change, right? But it's very possible that the masses of objects could change, especially if something gets broken, right? Like if you have one object and it splits into pieces. So I, I do want to be meticulous with my subscripts here. Okay, well then afterwards we'll need the mass of the white ball afterwards times by the velocity of the white ball after. And then we'll need the mass of the black ball after times the velocity of the black ball after. I don't care how you subscript this or how you notate it, but find a way to keep it organized. Because although this one's a pretty basic level question, it gets way more confusing once you're in the x and the y directions and you have four objects going everywhere. So I'll find a way to keep track of what's happening. Okay, so let's throw some stuff in. Mass of the white ball before didn't change. It's 0 0.15. The velocity of it before was 8. The mass of the white ball after was still 0 0.15. I know it didn't change, but I'm just being meticulous. The velocity of the white ball after was 2.5. The mass of the black ball after was still the same. I know it didn't change yet. Uh, and we want to find the velocity of the black ball after. As long as you can find a way to keep this organized and keep this you know, notated well enough for you to keep make sense of your work, I don't care how you do it. I need to look up there. kids might look at this and say, that actually makes complete sense, because the original velocity was 8. One of the velocities afterwards was 2.5, the other one was 5.5. 2.5 and 5.5 and 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 is 8. Okay, but the only reason why that works is because, go ahead. Yeah, since everything had the same mass, that's fair. The chances of everything having the same mass all the way through is, I mean, that's a one-off, right? So, uh, the thing I want to point out here is that you have to do this conservation momentums. Do not cancel stuff. Okay, it's, it's not worth it. This isn't like um, uh, the forces unit where sometimes mass will cancel here and there. Um, unless the mass of literally everything is the same, you really you can't do that. Right? The reason why this works is because there's a 0 0.15 here, here, and here. All of them have the exact same mass. If this mass right here was 0 0.16, you couldn't have done that. It doesn't cancel in that same way. So far, so good on the first one? Who's he as in this video? Okay, so here's one where they're going to stick together. And the reason why I want to point this out here, then, is that this changes the masses, right? 
Originally you have mass A, then you have mass B, but when they stick together, now the new object is mass C, or however you want to notate that. So make sure you're clear here. Let's draw a quick picture. You've got a, uh, a blue one with a mass of 2.3 kilograms, a red one, actually I'm going to keep going here. The blue one was moving to the right at 12 meters per second. The red one was moving to the left at 8.1 meters per second. Red was 5.6 kilograms. So that's kind of the before scenario, right? They're basically their head-on collision. What would happen if they each had the exact same momentum? They would stop. The chances of them having the exact same momentum, pretty low, right? One of them is going to like win this head-on collision, right? Um, in my mind, I like to think of like. Um, Maybe like sports, like a rugby or football kind of thing, where player A is going this way, player B is going this way. Man, whoever wins that fight, that's the direction they'll keep going, right? So, I mean, if the running back is strong enough, he can power through the linebacker, or the linebacker gets a full momentum, he takes him down, right? But chances are someone's going to win this fight here, right? So, the after scenario is that these two objects are now collectively together. Blue and red are now like one collective object and our question is are they going this way or are they going this way i'm not really sure which way is going to win now does that make sense what it's set up so again i don't care how you notate it i'm going to do something like this i'm going to do the mass of the what color are they again mass of the blue ball before times the velocity of the blue ball before plus the mass of the red ball before times the velocity of the red ball before should equal the mass of the, where do I go, blue-red. I'll just do that as my way of notating it. Whatever works for you. Mass of blue and red together after times the velocity of blue-red after. Does that kind of make sense how I'm setting this up? Again, I don't care what letters you use or how you do this. You don't have to do this note it the way I do it, but hopefully you'd agree. Like, it, it, if you're going to get a question like this, take the time to not, don't, don't get it wrong because you were running too fast for it. Okay, let's fill in the information we have. The mass of the blue ball before was 2.3. The velocity of the blue ball before was 12. The mass of the red ball before was 5.6, and its velocity was 8.1. Pause. Why am I wrong? We're going different directions, yeah. That, that, that matters. Right. So we need to assign positive or negative to be a certain direction. I don't necessarily care which one we pick. So why don't I make a positive B if you're going this way? and negative b if you're going that way. I don't care which one you pick, but we do need to assign someone positive and someone negative, which would make it a negative 8.1 velocity of set. So make sure you're very careful what positive and negative is. Now, I don't know which way these things are going to end up going. depends on who wins this fight. Um, but their collective mass afterwards is going to be, what is that, 7.9? And then this will be the velocity of both of them afterwards. You guys want to have breakfast? They've got bananas, muffins, yogurts, cheese drinks. Cheese drinks. Catch up on the map, let me know if you get some different. Same thing? 
Um, just to make sure we're clear on this here, don't do a double negative then. If you're going to put the negative in, say that it was going 2.2 .2 meters per second to the right, and then put the negative on, which really means it's going to the left. Right. So I guess you have two options here. You could say that it ended up going to the right, but it actually didn't because it's negative, so it's actually going the other way. Or just say 2.2 .2 meters per second to the left. Either of those should work. Uh, don't don't use left and the negative because that's like a double negative one. Is that pretty straightforward? Were you guys okay on the end of that last question? I don't know when you started getting talked to there. Oh, yeah, we started. You're good? Okay. Okay. Yeah. You guys okay on that last one? Okay, my favorite one. Um, this is what I'm hoping to do one day with an exploding paint, paint can, so long as I can get everybody on board from a safety point of view. Let's uh, have something explode. So uh, here's your scenario. Before you begin, you essentially you have a gun. Oh, this is my very basic version of a gun. And inside the gun is the bullet, right? So I'll just draw it like inside. Essentially what I'm going for is that when we begin on this one, they're actually all collected when we begin, right? So that's the before scenario. In the after scenario, the gun is going to recoil backwards this way while the bullet goes forward this way. Uh, once you get a little better at this and you're familiar with it, you can probably take a few shortcuts on exactly what you want to draw. I mean, I'll leave that up to you as to how detailed you need to be. But if you feel like you get the, get the sense of it, you can probably hop right to here. Before we begin, we need the mass of the gun and the bullet together, before. And we need the velocity of the gun and the bullet before. Which is zero, by the way. And then afterwards, we need to have the mass of just the gun afterwards, and the velocity of just the gun afterwards, plus the mass of just the bullet afterwards, and the mass of just the bullet. No, hang on, it's not mass. And the velocity of just the bullet afterwards. <laughs> Again, use whatever letters work for you. Mass of gun and bullet before, velocity of gun and bullet before, and then mass and velocity afterwards of the gun, mass and velocity afterwards of the bullet. Okay, so I think some of you already kind of pointed out here, although the gun and the bullet have a collective mass before we begin, because it sure would seem like they're not in motion before we start, if this is all zero here, we can just ditch this whole side. So this can be zero. Okay, so throwing out the numbers in here. Mass of gun... Five, velocity of gun we're looking for, mass of bullet 0 0.050, velocity of bullet 275, and solve. You guys are probably ahead of me at this point, but no? All right, never mind. I'll slow down then.
Let me know if this doesn't work out for you. I got 275. And I got a negative, which makes intuitive sense because if I assign the bullet as going in the positive direction, then the gun should be going in the negative direction. So that does kind of hopefully fit. Um, let's finish this off properly, though. I only get two sig digs, technically. So the velocity of the gun afterwards would be 2.8 meters per second, let's say backwards. I don't know, something like that. Left, I don't know, whichever direction you pick. So okay with it so far? Well, okay, so the next one I've got an easy way. Is the next one the cosine we did? Okay. okay. So the next one I'm going to show you how to do it the hard way. Then we're going to use the cosine law. The cosine law is going to take us a minute? Less than a minute? Yeah. Um, which is going to be like, okay, why did we do this in the first place? But then I'm going to show you the last question and show you why that wouldn't work in all situations. And so there is the possibility that you can get the really sucky question where you have to kind of break it up into x and y and all the dimensions. So I've left for these last ones here, I believe, like lots of extra space on extra pages there for you. So you guys feel ready? Okay, so the big twist on this one now is now we can't just go in the x direction. We have to do the x and y directions, which means that we have to do things independently. We have to find our x momentum. We have to find our y momentum and make those equal to each other. And then when we're done, we have to like hypotenuse by Pythagoras' theorem. I new verbs for that. You have to do the Pythagoras' theorem to finish it off when you're done. Okay, so this one here already even has a bit of a picture for you drawn. Uh, you've got a ball moving forward here. This is the glancing collision. It's moving forward. It's going to knock blue downwards and red up. This is your classic peel shot. Uh, we're going to do a lab on this where um, we won't actually probably physically go out and do it now, but a couple of years ago, we went out to the curling rink and uh, we took a video camera of an overhead shot of some people. Uh, I had Justin Delver um, do a couple of curling shots for us and we videotaped them. And then we tried to see if the momentum was concerned using tracker software. So I don't think we probably need to go back to the curling rink to take the video again, but do you really want to? Does anybody hear a curling? Are you curling? If I, could, if I can get us back into the curling rink, we can do it if you want. So. We, we basically we spent half an hour setting up a ladder and a video camera, and then did a peel shot, and then had to walk back to the school again. So. In the cold, yeah. So, we, we could. Yeah. We, I have the video already ready to go. All right. Anyways, here's the classic peel shot. Okay, so here's the thing we have to figure out, that we have to have x and y dimension momentum figured out. So I'm going to start in the x direction, and I'll do y direction afterwards. So in the x direction, before we start, we have the velocity of the red one before times the mass of the red one before. And I'm not going to bother with blue because it looks like blue is just sitting there. So I won't worry about that. And this is all in the x direction only, by the way, right? Then we're going to have the red one. The red one really is like a triangle here where the red one has some x directionality to it. And the blue one also has some x directionality to it as well. So... Before I actually write this out here, I'm going to do a little bit of trigonometry here. I don't actually know the angle that goes on the blue triangle, but I do know enough in the red triangle. Try to solve for that. So I could figure out how much of this is in the y direction and how much is in the x direction in terms of like its momentum. So I'll do that in a second though. Um, let's do the let's see the velocity of the red after times the mass of the red after plus actually I'm gonna make a change here. Sorry that you were writing all this. I have a different idea for how to organize this. You know how in the last examples there I was always doing mass and velocity both. 
Once you guys get pretty good at it, I think most of you are pretty good at not having to write out mass and velocity every single time. So you may find it more efficient to just do this. Let's do the momentum of the red one before. And let's find the momentum of the red one after plus the momentum of the blue one. You may find it a little bit easier just to work with it just in momentum rather than doing it like piece by piece by piece. You may find it more efficient. Okay, so for red, its momentum before is going to be 120 times 17.1 because those are its mass and velocity measurements before. We need the momentum of the red one in the x direction. Or we need a sine or cosine? Cosine. Because yeah. sine would give you the opposite. Cosine would give you the adjacent. So maybe a fast way of doing this would be to take the mass, which is still 120. It hasn't broken into pieces. 13.5. And then we're going to times that by the cosine of 23. And that should get us the momentum in just the x direction right there. That makes sense. And then I'm going to solve for the momentum of b in the x direction. I'm just going to leave for that one there. Let's try this. Uh, make sure you're in degrees, by the way, in case somehow you flip into radians. Uh, I have calculated a momentum for rock B, the blue one, in the x direction, only in the x direction, though, to be 5.60. Sorry about that. No, we're doing the we're doing the blues momentum in the x direction. Because okay. what we had is the red one coming in, which we knew. We found the x component of the red one right here. And so the leftover bit must be the blue rocks x momentum. Does that make sense? Did you guys get five point six? Okay. So just store that number because we'll need it later. Because we're gonna have to reuse it on the hypotenuse of the triangle. Keep that safe for later. I now have the blue momentum. So that's in the x direction. Now for the y direction. Um, as they began, how much y momentum did either of these rocks have? None. Now, I mean, you can notate that if you really want to, but essentially I can say before it started, since this rock was only going in the x direction to begin with, really there's nothing. So in a way, I can say that there's nothing to begin with, which means we need to account for the momentum of the red rock afterwards and the momentum of the blue rock afterwards. Well, what's the momentum of the red rock in the y direction? How do I calculate this momentum in the y direction going up here? What do I use differently? Just use sine. Yeah, right? So it's still 120 and 13.5, but now it's the sine of 23. That's your momentum of B. Well, whatever this number right here, it's going to be that number, but y negative. Yeah, right? One was going up. The negative just means the other one was going down. That's all. So 120 times 13.5 times the sine of 23. You guys good? Okay. So I've calculated for the momentum of the blue rock in y. I've got it as being negative 6.329. 
Um, you know, one quick point here. Some, some kids are likely to try to convert those back to velocities. Do not convert back to velocity until we are done the entire question because the masses could be different. Okay. Although you could try to calculate the velocity in x now and the velocity in y, it's best, just as a habit, to just keep working with momentum all the way through and then when you're done, divide by mass. So what we have now is essentially a new vector triangle. Kevin Cleaver, can you please come to the office? Kevin, can you come to the office? We have a new vector triangle where the blue rock goes somewhat to the x direction, somewhat in the down direction, which means that it has a resultant down here. We need that resultant. This is the 5.607 number. This is the 6.3298 number. We need to find that hypotenuse. Right, so Pythagoras theorem this thing. Uh, I've calculated its momentum on the hypotenuse to be 8.4566, something like that. Yes? Uh, I hope I did. I, I did go back and use those ones there. Check your seconds. All right, so I've got that as momentum on the hypotenuse. So then for the last bit here, the question I believe actually asks the velocity of the blue one. So then to finish it, divide by the mass of the blue one. And the blue one, this is why this is really important here. See how this one had a different mass than this one here? Let's deal with its mass only when we're done, okay? So it just it eliminates the chance of screwing things up if the masses are different. So if we want to then divide by what did I just say, two thirty one, that should get us our velocity on the hypotenuse. So I've got a velocity of three point at six six. You get three six six? Yeah, it looks like it. Okay, so three point six six. Meters per second. One, one stop. Okay, and then one more thing. There's a good chance that uh, if they do this sort of thing, they'll make the linked question. Part A, what's the magnitude of the velocity? Part B, what angle is it going at? All right. So if we need to calculate that angle, we need to like inverse tangent probably this thing right here to calculate that angle right there. So I will inverse tangent. The six number divided by the five number. I got uh, 48.5. Okay. So let's say that was going. Did you have like directions to it? Yeah, I did east. Okay. So that's east. 48.5 degrees to the south. I know this is only like one example, but you guys feel like you get the gist of what to do. Momentum questions suck. <laughs> They're a lot of work. Um, or at least they can be a lot of work. But the good news is, in some examples, I can show you how to cheat, and not cheat, but use the whole sum up. So let me show you how to redo this question in under a minute. But in the next one, you'll see why it wouldn't have worked on the next one. So for this question here, though, if we use the cosine law, let me let me know if I lose you on this concept here. This only works because one of the objects was sitting flat. But essentially, what we have is a momentum of one that goes slightly upwards. There was also one that sprayed slightly downwards, and then this is the momentum of the one coming inwards. Now, we have to do this with momentum. You can't do it with velocities, but we could find the momentum of the one that went upwards, and we have that one. Momentum of that one going upwards here was 120 by 13.5. This one was 120 by 13.5. This is the one that we were unsure of, right here, because this was the blue one that was going to go down. You know, I mean, we know now that it went at what was it, three meters per second? 
and then the one going straight in was the 120 at 17.1. Uh, one more thing, we actually know this angle right here, because that angle is 23 degrees. So in theory, we should be able to cosine law this thing and solve for that magnitude right there. So, um, I don't know, c squared equals 120 times 13.5 squared plus 120 times 17.1 squared minus 2. I'm just going to say use that number again there, use that number again there, cosine of 23. You guys able to follow that? You're probably doing this all in the calculator in one step anyways. Um, I do all of that. You guys can catch up in a second here. When I square root it, I got 8, 4, 5, 6, 6, 2, 9. Yes. Right, which is good, right? Because this should match up what we did the first time around for blue. This is though, this is a momentum number still, though, right? This is kilograms meters per second. So we just have to divide by the mass of the blue ball. Make sure you're careful here, though. Did you guys all get the same number? Okay. Make sure you divide by the mass of the blue ball, though, not the mass of 120. So the mass of blue was 231. But you guys see how you get the same thing? You should be able to get the same thing a second time around. So, so this is a nice little trick you can play if the scenario fits. So you can kind of see how, ideally I'd show you this beforehand, right? And be like, just do cosine law, it's way easier. Right? But the last example we're going to do here, I'll show you why it doesn't always work. Because you have to have the right setup for the cosine law fit. Uh, one more thought. Do you guys feel comfortable pulling off that cosine law? I'm pretty sure you can use it if it's glancing, but there's one more requirement. You have to know this angle right here. Um, I think there's a possible question where you get this guy going in, you get this guy right here, and you're given that angle instead, maybe? I don't know if I'm able to pull it off of that one, actually. You should be able to do it for most glancing coaches. Okay. Um, I, th I think it should work. But just make sure you have the right information to pull up. Uh, one more thought here. You might need the angle. To calculate that angle, it's a little bit more challenging. You need to use a sine law because you need to like calculate this big angle right here. And then once you know this big angle right here, or say this angle right here, you can use some math principles that allow you to figure out like what this angle right here happens to be. That makes sense. Because this, this is the one that we need that was like 48.5, I think it was. So you'd have to like solve for this angle, solve for this angle, and then do like some subtraction and say, well, if this is A and all of this is all of this is B, then this right here would be B minus A, and then this makes this A again over here. Like you have to like rework this around to solve for this angle right here. I feel like you guys probably have done that before though. So. Okay, last one then. This is the sucky one. All right. I screwed this one up two years ago. I remember it because I missed a negative sign and it screwed everything up horribly. So I don't think I'm messing up today. Here, here's the setup. What you've got is an intersecting collision where this guy right here is coming in, this guy's coming in, all right? 
and they're going to bank off of each other. The reason why the cosine law is not going to work here is if I tried to draw a vector, I'd have to draw one going down like this, then one coming back up like that, one more going up like this, one kind of coming back down like that. There is no triangle. Does that make sense? So like when I was checking with Naomi a second ago, I think this really is only going to work if one of the objects is stationary, because then you really have three vectors, one coming in and two exiting. Does that make sense why this one kind of stinks? So you kind of have to do this using the broken up method. So. OK, here we go. Let's start off in the x direction. We need to know the momentum of the red ball in the x direction. We need to know the momentum of the blue ball in the x direction. And then afterwards, we need to know the momentum of the red one and the momentum of the blue one. This is kind of my before and after. I'm kind of going easier on the subscripts at this point here. So long as you guys feel like you've got it organized in your head. Okay. If I were to draw a triangle here, for this one here, and I wanted the x direction. Am I using sine or cosine? Cosine, cosine yeah. Um, typically, typically it's cosine for x, sine for y, as long as it's drawn in standard position. I don't know what standard position is. A standard position is uh, like remember remember doing like quadrants and stuff like this in trig in our math class. Standard position would be where you have this angle here, or this one here, this one here, or this one here. If you start talking about this angle up here, this is not a standard position angle because it's not the angle that goes like around like that, around a circle. So there's a general rule. I mean, you should always double check it, I guess, just to be safe. But if you're looking for x, it's probably cosine. If you're looking for y, it's probably sine. Okay, so momentum of the red ball beforehand, but only in the x direction. Let's see. Red was moving at 120 at 10. And that's going to need the cosine of 30. Then the blue ball was 231, 15. And again, this will have the same sort of thing, right? When you're looking for the x amount of this, it'll need the cosine of 40. Except if I do this, I'm going to make the mistake I made two years ago. No, I'm not. Not in the x direction. In the y direction. Don't let me forget, by the way, when we get to the y direction, one has to be negative. Okay? In the x direction, though, they are both going this way here. We'll make that way be positive. Don't let me forget the negative. Okay, the second half of the equation is how much momentum is there when we're done. Uh, when we're done, we know information about the red ball. The red ball, I don't think its mass has changed in this instance here, so it's still 120. Now it's by 13.5, though. And its new angle is now the cosine of 25. And what we do not know is the momentum of B in the x direction. So this is not the full momentum of B, it's only the x component of it. 122. Okay, I've got a momentum to be in the x direction. Twenty two twenty five. I'll just write it all out in case I need to find this number later. Kilogram meters per second. Later, we will uh, hypotenuse this to get an actual on the angle vector, but we'll do that later. You guys have this number? Come on, board. Don't throw me. Okay, next. 
y direction. We need the momentum of red in the y direction, momentum of blue in the y direction, momentum of red in the y direction, momentum of blue in the y direction. We're not going to get the negative signs wrong. Okay, um, can we go with up as positive, down as negative? Does that work? So since red is going up, let's see, red was 120 times 10, but now it's going to be the sine of 30. I'm not even looking at the original example, I'm just looking at what I had right here, and I'm taking the exact same info, I'm just changing it for the y direction. But since blue is going down, I'm going to do like, rather than add, I'll just subtract. Does that work? 231 by 15 by sine of 40. Does that work? Because there's some momentum in the up direction, but there's some in the down direction. Then for the red ball afterwards, the red one is going up. So then the red one going up is going to be 120, 13.5 sine of 25. And this should get us the momentum of the blue ball in Y. Before I type this all in, I'm expecting a negative number. So I hope it ends up being negative. Because it should be negative because that's the downward direction. I sure hope. 20 by 10 by the sine of 30 minus 231 by 15 by the sine of 40 minus come back one, come back. 120 by 15.5 by the sine of 20. Yeah, I got a negative. Momentum of blue in the y direction, I've now calculated to be negative 23.1190652. You can see why this sucks, eh? Yeah. Um, okay, I haven't been teaching for that long, and one of the downsides is we only do physics every other year. I've seen them throw on these questions, but most of the time on the diploma, they give one-dimensional questions. But I have seen them throw on two-dimensional questions, at least somewhere on the test. Um, they might do a two-dimensional um, question in this unit. There's also the chance to do this in the electrostatics unit and the magnetics unit. So somewhere on the diploma, I would expect a two-dimensional question that needs to get solved using something like this. Whether it's momentum or not, I don't know. But hope, hopefully you'll get most of these being one-dimensional, and then it's way less time. So. All right, last thing. You guys probably don't need me to write it out so much anymore. We were looking for that velocity, right? So do Pythagoras' theorem with these numbers and uh, solve for the angle. So one was going this way, one was going this way. There's your hypotenuse. There's your angle. This one was the 23.119 number. This one here was 22.25. So, calculator. That number squared plus that number squared in brackets. Square root. I got 32. 32? Okay. Uh, 32.089. But again, that is a momentum number still. So I do have to divide by its mass to get a velocity. So its mass would be, where is it? 231 again still? Yeah, 231. Let's divide by 231. All right, I got a final answer velocity of 13.9 meters per second. Maybe we'll calculate that, or let me know if you don't, I guess.
Okay, and then last thing we need that angle. So inverse tan v opposite. Yeah, don't use the negative on that though, right? So you know how like there was a there, there was a negative on like say this value right here. I ignore it when you're solving the question here. Just know that it's negative because it's going down. That's all. Opposite over adjacent. Forty six degrees. Forty six point one. Where's this one? Uh, I guess we should go back up to the original question. Two. Yeah, good call. Um, based on this angle right here, that angle of um, 30 degrees only gives us two sig digs. So I guess I gotta change this. This is gonna make it 14 meters per second at, let's see, it's gonna be east, 46 degrees south. That should be our final answer. That makes sense. Okay. Um, I would say that most of the struggle for kids in this unit here is that, well, it sucks. <laughs> um, you guys can hopefully see why I've tried to prep you a little bit for this with the work we did in the dynamics unit, where we've done questions like this with this kind of amount of work. Um, you could get this. You will get one like this somewhere on your desk in one of these units. So keep it organized, I guess, is the advice I'd give you. Try to find a way to find your own system for how you keep track of what's happening. When I started the first examples with you guys, I was doing subscripts everywhere, right? But like, if you feel comfortable, do what I started doing here, where like I started kind of taking some shortcuts here and there, and I, I just went right to momentum instead of doing mass blue before, velocity blue after, right? Like, that was getting a little bit tedious. So find your own system. Keep it organized. Typically, cosine for x, sine for y. Don't screw up the negative sign. If something goes up and something goes down, don't miss that, because that would really change things. That's all I got. Is there any questions? Make sense? OK. Um, <laughs> we got one more set of notes, and then we're done out of your unit. Really? So, good job, guys. Um, I mean, take whatever time you have left today if you want. Maybe try a few more questions. If you have the answer key to the assignment, by the way, already done, because it's the same one that I had last year. So whenever you do want to mark this one, if you're going to finish it, you can. So.